I guess I'm stage left. Okay. Good evening and welcome. I'm Reverend Hirsch, Associate Dean of the Wagner School here at NYU. I want first to thank and also welcome John Bradamus, whose name we are gathering here tonight. In a time of great turmoil, when leaders cling to power as hundreds of thousands march defiantly in the streets, when the tragedy in Tucson has become a watchword for declining civility in politics, when our nation faces urgent economic, social, and environmental problems, it can be reassuring to turn to an earlier time. We can look back first to the 1940s, the World War II era of the greatest generation, so-called, when Trent Lott was born in a small Mississippi shipbuilding town, and Tom Daschle was born in a small South Dakota city. Fast forward to the 1970s, when each was first elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, each rising rapidly to leadership positions in their respective parties. In the 1980s, these two men were elected to the United States Senate, two years apart. Senator Lott subsequently became the U.S. Senate Majority Leader in 1996 as the highest leadership position in the United States Senate. In early January 2001, with the Senate divided 50-50 after the historic and agonizing election of 2000, he passed the gavel to his Democratic counterpart, Senator Daschle, in a ceremony marked by civility and a graceful transfer of power amid great uncertainty. This change would become a habit. Two weeks later, Majority Leader Daschle handed the gavel back to Senator Lott, and later that summer, after Senator J Jim Jeffords of Vermont crossed the aisle to join the Democratic Party, Senator Daschle again became majority leader. That is, in United States history, un U.S. history, an unprecedented three gavel exchanges in the first few months of 2001. Again, it's a period that was fraught with tension, but these two extraordinary lawmakers from different parties, completely different sections of the country, handled all the transitions with generosity and goodwill. Many of us in this audience, many of us around the country, look back to that period with nostalgia. That was, after all, before September 11th, 2001 before the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, before the near collapse of the global economy two years ago. Many of us worry now that Congress is too often paralyzed by political divisions to act, and gridlock will only grow now that we're back under divided government. Both Senators Lott and Dash remain deeply engaged in public life. Each has written a book that sheds valuable light on workings of American public policy. Senator Daschle's book is called Critical, What We Can Do About the Health Care Crisis. And I'm among, I am among a number of professors who've taught parts of that book here at NYU. Senator Lott's book is a little more personal and a little more revelatory of what it's like to run the U.S. Senate. It's called Herding Cats. <laughs> it is our great good fortune to have a conversation this evening with these two distinguished senators, co-majority leaders, one could almost say, to and welcome them to New York University this evening for, again, what promises to be a riveting conversation. Under the auspices of NYU's John Bradamus Center for the Study of Congress, we proudly welcome Tom Daschle and Trent Lott. We're going to have a conversation um, up here on the stage for about 35 or 40 minutes um, after we've exhausted one another's goodwill and good graces. Um, we're going to turn it open to you. There'll be mics in the audience. I'll remind you then that if you'd like to ask a question of either or both of these gentlemen, please line up and I'll alternate the mics at that point. But I'll kick it off and I would love to ask you to, I'll jump right in. There's been a lot of um, criticism of the U.S. Senate and the way it's been run, particularly in the last handful of years. Um, a, a almost legendary piece in The New Yorker, for example, by George Packer, um, describing it as an institution that was almost ungovernable at this point. You've both governed it in the recent past. Talk a bit about what's happened, what's happening to your institution. As you can see, uh, we've worked together so, so long, we yield to each other. <laughs> I'm going to yield to Tom first. Well, I, uh, I think a number of things. First of all, our country is so deeply divided philosophically and politically right now, and I think the Congress reflects that political and philosophical division. So it starts with that. To a large extent, I think, unfortunately for both parties, control of Congress becomes the paramount goal. And because it is the paramount goal, 
there's a reluctance to cooperate, a reluctance to be as supportive of whatever procedural or substantive questions may be before you. So it starts with that. I think is another unfortunate fact of life is members of the Senate and House don't spend the kind of time they used to in Washington. They're too busy traveling around. They're, most of them don't even bring their families to Washington any longer. Their families stay in their states. And so there's not the chemistry, the kind of opportunity for people to get to know one another like they used to and build relationships and friendships and ultimately a trust. And that trust is so critical to doing legislative work. And I think I'd start with that. There are a lot of other things, but I'll defer to my friend and colleague uh, Trent for additional thoughts on the, on the question. Well, first of all, let me say on behalf of Tom and myself, we're delighted to be here at this uh, great university and this law school. I, I noted earlier tonight a lot of my contemporaries at law school wound up coming to NYU Law School to get their LLM in taxation because I had a lot of CPAs uh, that were uh, in my class and uh, around me. So we're delighted, I'm delighted to be here. And we're here really because this is the John Bradamus uh, Center. Uh, when John and I were in the House together, he was the Democrat whip and I became the Republican whip right at the end of his time in the House. And uh, in those days, uh, you know, I'd meander over to the Democratic side of the aisle and uh, pursue uh, John and talk to him about what the Democrats were up to. And that's kind of the way uh, John and I, I mean, uh, Tom and I work when we're in the House together too. I, first of all, I would disagree a little bit with the idea that it's become dysfunctional. You have to study the history of the Senate and of our country. The, the Senate has, was designed to be dysfunctional. Uh, I mean, our forefathers intended for it to be a great deliberative body. And you can argue that it's not that anymore. Uh, I had a reporter ask me this week, how many times, uh, you know, when you were there, do you remember the debate actually influencing the outcome of a vote. And I had to confess, not very much, but on occasion it did happen, and I think it happens even less now. Uh, but, uh, you know, it was designed to force consent consensus. The, the Senate was the place that, uh, you've heard the expression, was going to cool off the hot action of the House. And it takes, it's, it takes a real lift to, to move things in the Senate. When we were there, we both talked about how, you know, how easy it was to kill something and how hard it was to pass something. So first of all, you have to remember that's the way the Senate was designed. The second thing is uh, the times are different. Uh, when I came to the House in the, in the 70s, when I was the whip in the, the House uh, for the Republicans in the 80s, and then when we were in the leadership together uh, in the 90s and the early part of the century, uh, a lot of things were different. Uh, part of the problem is modern technology. You know, when I first came to work as a, for a Democrat uh, in 1968 in Washington, there were no fax machines. There were no cell phones. Uh, members of Congress, I think, had six round trips home a year. And as a staff member, I had zero trips home. So you stayed in Washington and you worked. And in the afternoons at 5.30, we had returned every call. We had written, we had answered every letter. And the congressman I worked for signed those letters. And then I'd break out the old granddad bourbon, <laughs> and uh, he drank it with Coke, and I'd r ruin an, something already a very poor quality bourbon with Coke and just destroy it, and he'd light up a cigar, cigar and he'd reminisce. <laughs> he would talk about history and his philosophy. That just couldn't happen now, because members are, are they're, they're so torn. Tom and I were talking about one of the reasons why we don't all really miss, uh, you know, being in the Senate is the, the amount of time you have to spend raising money, you know, it takes millions. You know, when we first, I, my first campaign, I spent $119,000 for a house seat. Now a house seat costs half a million, a million, two million dollars you've got to raise, which is just unfathomable. But uh, so you're caught up in that. Uh, you've got all the pressure of the computers and the fax machines and the cell phones, and they're on airplanes every, every Thursday night back home. Their families are back there. Tom and I develop a, a friendship. Our wives are friends. We, I actually enjoy their company very much. Part of what, <laughs> <laughs> I know that, that. Comes as a real shock to most people. <laughs> <laughs> I know that is, a, that is a shock. We actually like each other. We enjoy each other's company. I mean, two senators from opposite parties, opposite parts of the country. But of course, part of it was that, um, you know, Tom and I went through hell together 
on opposite sides of the aisle. But we, we went through being going back and forth, majority and minority. We, we went through the 9-11 experience. We went through the anthrax attack, which actually affected his personal office. Uh, we, we did a, a presidential impeachment trial together. Uh, when you go through those kind of tough battles, you become friends. But through it all, I, I, part of the reason why I think we got along is because we, we treat each other uh, decently and, and like friends. I mean, we, we tried not to surprise each other. We tried not to lie to each other. And every now and then when I would do something stupid and I realized it, I actually would go to his office and say, gee, Tom, maybe we can talk this out. He'd come to my office. And we'd sit down. Uh, that doesn't happen a lot now. But I do think it, that sort of problem can be resolved by something called leadership. The Senate will change back when a few good women and men of goodwill say, look, this has gotten kind of bad. We, we've got to begin to find a way to find out how can we do a trade bill or an energy bill or an aviation bill and not always look for a way to state our positions and fight about it. So, uh, well, uh, I touched on several different points, but uh, it was just to, you know, uh, embellish a little bit of what uh, Tom was saying. Well, I, I would just, uh, first of all, let me also emphasize how thrilled we are to be uh, able to see John Bradamus, who we admire as much as we do, and to, to we're, we're actually humbled and honored that so many of you would want to come out on a night like this. So thank you for that as well. I. Uh, this is larger than most towns in South Dakota, so <laughs> this, is, this is a big deal to talk to this many people. Um, I would, Trent mentioned this, but I would, I'd say that technology is one of the biggest changes that have had huge changes. You can't begin to explain it all, but I mean, just the fact that email and internet and, and uh, the technological applications to legislating today, the transparency that comes with it, uh, you know, part of what we think of as dysfunctionality is, is really, as Trent said, no different than it was before, but it's so much more evident now. You see it all. I mean, you're in the hearing rooms, and you're, you know, you, 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 there's instantaneous coverage on everything. And I think C-SPAN, frankly, and, I, and I'm a big fan and, and admirer, I voted for C-SPAN coverage, but I will say that there is a downside to C-SPAN that it just comes with the territory. There's two, actually two. One is nobody has to go to the floor anymore to hear a speech because they can get it in their office. And, and so you never, I mean, you, most senators are speaking to an empty chamber when they're speaking on the Senate floor, and that's unfortunate. It used to be in the old days, people would come down to hear uh, the, the, the give and take because that's the only way you'd hear what was going on. The other thing, and, and I say both Republicans and Democrats do this, but they play to the camera rather than to the members or, uh, and so you get a lot more hyperbolic uh, speech making and a lot more uh, stuff that's more directed to a national audience in the hope that maybe the news media will catch a phrase or a clip and play it and give the, the senator particular coverage. That comes with the territory. That's a higher price to pay for transparency and the good things that come with it than I wish we had to, but it's a fact of life. I had a reporter actually ask me this week, Tom, well, okay, if that's the case, why did you make a speech on the floor? And I said, well, probably for two or three reasons. One, because you are making the legislative record. You were talking, you're talking actually, to, in some respects, to the courts, because they, they look to the legislative history of a bill, and what you say on the floor is something that they will review sometime and make a decision. So you are doing it for a good reason. Secondly, I, I said, usually I'd do it when I was really agitated and felt passionate about something. And, and, and the other reason, the main reason is because you had to. Somebody had to go to the floor and state their, you know, the Republican leadership position or the committee position. Uh, but I do remember one great debate, Tom, and I'm sure you were there. It was actually involved Bill Bradley and Jack Danforth. Bill Bradley, Senator from uh, New Jersey, and Jack Danforth in Missouri. And I don't even remember what the bill was, but they had an animated, active, really great debate. And they, one of those cases where they started ignoring the presiding officer and talking to each other. It was a great debate. And it was one of those occasions I remember thinking that night, it affected my vote. Jack Danforth actually flipped my position as a result of the debate. Pat Monahan had the ability to do that. I, re I also remember, and I, I think you 
I think we've talked about this, but uh, during the impeachment process, uh, we had a big debate about whether it should be televised or not televised, and we struck sort of a compromise, and that at one point, the cameras were left and we were, in a, were, were shut down, and we had the executive session as every senator uh, came to the podium, down to the well, uh, to express how they were gonna vote and why. And I would say it's the single most collective, uh, Im collectively impressive set of speeches I ever heard. Yeah. I mean, it was the most honest, some were very emotional, uh, some tears were shed at times. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was really a breathtaking thing to watch. And Trent and I were the last two speakers, and I remember how am I going to live up to the quality and the standards set by a lot of those speakers during that time? But it was, you would have had a, t a totally different environment. That wouldn't have happened if the cameras were going. Yeah, I remember that night on both sides of the aisle, uh, the eight, senator after senator would give up, get up, and it was a closed session. Uh, staff was gone, cameras were out of there, and uh, they would get up and speak. And I, I don't want to raise, make you snicker or raise any hackles here, but I remember John Edwards got up and gave a, a tremendous speech uh, against uh, the impeachment articles. And I remember one of our last speakers that I chose to speak for the Republicans was a very thoughtful senator by the name of Richard Luger. And he gave a, he gave an unbelievable presentation. So you're right, that was uh, one of the high points. And when, when the impeachment trial was over, uh, Tom and I met in the center aisle and shook hands and, and basically said to each other, we did it. We fulfilled our constitutional responsibility, which we had thrust upon us that we did not want to have to do, but we had to do it. But we did it in such a way that we felt like we had brought credit to the institution, uh, and we l concluded it in such a way that we could go back to work the next week as if we had not been through any of it. That was a real challenge. One last memory on that, and, I'll, and then we'll move on. But uh, I, I, do you remember there was a bomb scare, right? Oh, right yeah. after the impeachment, there was a bomb scare. We all had to evacuate the building. Yep. And that was before anybody, we had any process at all for what to do with a bomb threat. So our security, my security detail started driving me around, and they said, we can't go back for a while. What do you want to do? And I said, well, I haven't been to the Space Museum for a while. <laughs> So we just, my security detail and I were just kind of looking around at all the space vehicles, you know, with the bomb scare going on a few blocks away at the cap. This is, I thought, what a contrast. Here we've just, you know, made history in the most monumental way with this impeachment thing, and now I'm looking at rockets and missiles and all kinds of airplanes. Another kind of history. I seem to be Mike Liss, I'm just going to talk loud. I want to stay inside the Senate for a moment if we could. Um, it's not often that a Senate rule becomes the subject of a public opinion um, conversation. But it is now the case, as at least some recent polling by Pew and others, that the filibuster and the hold to go along with it is one of the least popular aspects of American public life. Um, talk a bit about the, that sacrosanct rule and pressures that you at least feel from the public to bring about some change. Well, holds a hold is a term that is uh, probably a little bit of a misnomer, but it's it's it it's the uh, it's it's a uh, a notice by any senator. And anybody can do this uh, to the leader that they intend to filibuster a particular nomination or piece of legislation. That's what a hold is. So you know that if you bring this bill to the floor, uh, it's going to be subject to all of the parliamentary machinations that go with filibusters. You have to file, there's a, you have to get a cloture vote, and then that has to ripen before you actually get the vote uh, after 30 hours, and then there's, uh, and that could be on the motion to proceed, so there's a whole series of hurdles. So basically, if a leader is trying to manage the time uh, on the floor as effectively as possible, the knowledge that you're gonna have to go through all those hoops on a nomination or on a piece of legislation, makes you want to go somewhere else and look for another piece of legislation that you can get to the floor that isn't going to be held. And so uh, the problem is that there's been a long tradition, there's no rule about this, but there's a long tradition that the holds are secret, that the, the leader does not divulge which senator has a hold on which nominee or legislation. It's tantamount right now to requiring unanimous consent on every nomination just to take it to the floor. And that's a pretty high bar for nominees. And as a result, you've got, uh, either in Democratic or Republican administrations, a huge, a plethora of, of, of nominees that sit and languish for a long, long time 
uh, because of these holds. And so I understand the frustration and I personally believe that we ought to at least make the holds public and uh, I, I wouldn't have any problem with that. Two of the biggest problems that uh, the majority leader and the minority leader of either party have, particularly the majority leader who has to manage the, the floor, his, his biggest weakness is time. So if a senator shows up and says, you call that up, I'm going to filibuster it. Or I want to have adequate time to express myself or offer amendments. That is just, you know, it just caused you to have to say, well, I'll, I'll just have to set it aside. But also, uh, it, it's not just a problem on, on the Democratic side if you're a Republican. And quite often, the biggest problem I'd have would be on my side of the aisle. And we even had what to call rolling holes. I would find out who had a hold and go after him or her, and all of a sudden he'd say, okay, I'm off. I'm not doing it anymore. Boop. And somebody else would do it. So, it, yeah. And, and it, so it would become a problem. And sometime I was doing it because I told Tom, look, that's ridiculous. I'll try to find out who's doing this. And, and uh, it, it, uh, it really has been abused. And Tom and I tried twice to, to you know, fix it a little bit. So I thought what they did uh, last week was a, a positive move. There shouldn't be secret holes. Uh, and they shouldn't, frankly, I don't think they should be this sort of rolling hole thing. So they, they did make some change there. Uh, Tom and I have talked about how the confirmation process is outrageous for every president. They send up nominations. First, first of all, what they have to go through and the amount of paperwork they have to fill out for a nomination. A lot of good people just said, no, I, I, I'm not going to do that. I can't, you know, I've got a business here, I've got a law firm, and they just say, I, I don't want to go through the process. I thought they did a good job. But uh, I think they're going to take 300 and something nominees off the list that wouldn't even have to too. be confirmed by the, by the Senate. And I thought that was a good move. On the filibuster itself, uh, I think they also made the right decision by backing away on trying to limit the filibuster. The Senate is a place where minority rights are protected. And you might think, well, you know, golly, why didn't the Democrats do something about this while they've got the majority? It's because they know they could be the minority in two years and then they will need that extra tool. I do think that the leaders should be, I mean, I was guilty of it, Tom was guilty of it, we did all kind of polymerated tricks, we'd fill up the tree, which means we would block amendments, or uh, you know, we would do everything we could to uh, keep the other side from getting what they wanted done, and that's still being done, but I think it has grown and grown and grown and grown. One of the things I do have a problem with is that amount of time that you can tie up the opposing party on the motion to proceed to a bill. You can filibuster the motion to proceed. This is before you even get on the bill. And then after you get 60 votes, then it's 30 hours before you can move on to the bill. I, I'm, I think they made the right decision of not taking that away, but I do think that the leaders, uh, the current leaders, McConnell and Reed, they did a handshake saying basically we're going to try to work together to avoid more filibusters. And Harry Reid made a call yesterday, the, the Democratic leader at present, when McConnell said, I'm going to offer the repeal of health care to the Federal Aviation Administration bill. Normally the opposing leader would say, you know, over my dead body we'll fight to the death, I'll fill up the tree, I'll block you, we'll raise hell. Harry Reid said, look, let, they're going to get this vote sooner or later, let them get it out of the system. We've got the votes, they can't, they can't get 60 votes, the Republicans. Let them have the vote, then they will have fulfilled their commitment and then maybe we can move on to an aviation bill and an energy bill and a trade bill. I thought that was a smart move by Harry. And my guess is that McConnell, the Republican leader, will reciprocate in some way. One good gesture begets another good gesture in life and in politics. I, I, that is so true. You know, just to give you a sense, though, on how it's changed, in the, in the 20th century, for the first half of the 20th century, we averaged two cloture votes a Congress. That is, one a year. And then in the, we got into the, the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and that went up to five or six cloture votes uh, per Congress. In the 110th Congress, which just was the one that just finished, uh, we had 120 cloture votes. So it's gone just like, if you can imagine a graph, 120 cloture votes in the last Congress. So there is a huge change. I, what I would, I would like to at least consider is to go back for two years 
and just say, okay, we're not going to, we're going to do two things the way they used to back in the 20th century. One is if you're filibustering, you got to hold the floor. And secondly, we're not going to dual track any longer. That is, we're not going to set the bill aside and move on to something else uh, because right now we're quintuple tracking at times. You know, we're setting bills aside constantly to find one you can actually get to. And I think it would be worth experimenting. And, and, I, and I'm like Trent, I wouldn't support changing the rules per se, uh, except on the motion to proceed and maybe on some nominations. But, but I think at the, the core, you ought to test whether it would still work. If you had to hold the floor and you didn't dual track, uh, whether you could bring that number from 120 back down to five or six. I'm going to pull the lens out a bit nationwide this time and ask you to think a bit about the Tea Party both as a phenomenon in American politics and as a group that in many states is targeting your old colleague. You mentioned Richard Lugar earlier. He's a Tea Party um, target now. Orrin Hatch, um, folks from both parties. I'm just curious about what you make of this uh, perhaps momentary, perhaps longer lived phenomenon in American politics at present. Well, since uh, they're generally Republicans, but not uh, all Republicans, the members themselves, I think, are you know a mix. I think they're independents, a lot of independents, and some Democrats too. It is a phenomenon. I don't think that it's going to be as transitory as some people think. Uh, this may this may last longer <coughs> than uh, we might anticipate, or would some some people would like for it to last. Uh, you know, with that group, I'm, I'd be probably one of their targets. I would be considered establishment. You know, I was, I was the original revolutionary. I was a Republican in Mississippi when people had never even seen a Republican. <laughs> but at least I drew a good crowd because they want to see what one looked like. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I, when you look at the things they talk about, uh, the Constitution and they're worried about the debt and the deficit, uh, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, reason for that. And I think you're seeing that Republicans and Democrats are beginning to respond to some of that today uh, Chairman Inouye of the Appropriations Committee announced that they weren't going to have any earmarks. Uh, I understand why he did that. I'm one of those that thinks, uh, you know, Congress should not give up the opportunity to, to do earmarks. But there again is a case where over time the process was abused. When I first came to Congress, you had to justify an earmark, which is an addition of language or usually money. But to get an earmark for the Corps of Engineers and appropriations bill, it had to first have been authorized. And you couldn't just stick it in a bill in a conference between the two bodies that had never been, or a line item, that had never been considered by a committee in either body or in either body. So, um, you know, it has been abused. And I do think it's time we take a time out, decide how we're going to do it going forward. Um, it upsets me when as I see some of my colleagues uh, in, within my own party being attacked by, you know, uh, people from the Tea Party attacking a Republican, even, even one that they serve in the Congress with. Uh, and and sometimes I just, I, some of the, t the attacks, regardless of whether it's a Republican or Democrat, I, I just think it gets out of hand. It's gotten, it's gotten mean-spirited. And I, 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 obviously I would defend, say it's not just Republicans, They're, the discourse has, I think has coarsened. And, uh, that, I think part of that is what Tom was talking about. When you don't know people, you don't have dinner together, you don't socialize together, you don't talk, it's a lot easier to try to, you know, put a knife in their ribs. And so, uh, so you, you know, that we, we're missing that opportunity for camaraderie. I think the Tea Party uh, movement is going to be around at least one more election. Um, you know, as a Republican, I hope it's positive. It could be negative. Uh, I think that... Uh, we lost three Senate seats last year because we nominated the wrong people. Uh, I've said that publicly, and I've, I've had my head handed to me by the Tea Party. <laughs> but I, uh, but I'm, not, bother I'm not running for anything anymore. I'm going to say what I think. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've talked about it. I to you. Well, I, I, you know, it's hard to top that. I mean, I agree with everything Trent said. I, let, me, I, let me touch on the two things Trent talked about. One is the earmarks. I'm sure if we took a poll in this room, it'd probably be 90 to 10 in, in opposition to earmarks. But I, I, I share Trent's view passionately. I really think it ought to be elected officials that decide where the money goes rather than unelected. Yeah. And I think there ought to be transparency. 
Uh, and I think there ought to be, as, as Trent said, a, a, a process by which these are evaluated. We have to clean up the abuse because there has been a lot of it. Uh, but I'm not sure how you make a decision today. If you represent New York City and NYU and there are certain infrastructure requirements that have to be uh, achieved in order to uh, continue to, to improve the quality of life here, if your congressperson can't make the advocacy for that particular commitment and resources, who does? I mean, where's that going to come from? And so it seems to me that, that that's really part of the, the, the democratic process. Yeah, I agree. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll come back to our senses, do the necessary reforms, but, but also recognize that, uh, that that's part of what, what we're there for. Uh, with regard to the Tea Party, I, I think, you know, we, we have a lot of different groups that come and go, and I think it's good that, uh, that, that people are engaged and people are uh, out there passionately expressing themselves. I and mean, we've had uh, left groups and right groups. We had a lot of groups when I was in college. I, I think I got in politics because I became passionate about the Vietnam War and, I, you know, and, and about uh, uh, a lot of the issues in the 60s. That was part of the reason that motivated me. Um, you know, but, but I think, so I think the pendulum swings and people, what I, what I worry about with the Tea Party is their, is their lack of willingness to find common ground and, and the understanding that the only way this country is going to work as a, as, as a democracy and as a republic is if we can reconcile the differences that we have and at least right now I don't see enough of that among a lot of those who are outspoken Tea Party members. There's just not, there doesn't seem to be a willingness to, to say, okay, it, it can't be 100% your way. Uh, maybe it can be 50%. You know, maybe we can find a way to find common ground. And I think that's the essence of a good democracy and a good republic. One little side story, in my state of Mississippi, we actually did d defeat two incumbent uh, Democrat members of Congress last year. Uh, but the, the Republican nominees both defeated the Tea Party candidates. They were not the Tea Party nominees. In fact, the Tea Party nominee against uh, one of the uh, Republican congressmen now, the one that defeated Gene Taylor, Congressman Gene Taylor, actually endorsed the Democrat in the general election. So somebody asked me, well, why didn't, of all places, you would think the Tea Party movement would really be strong in Mississippi. So why, why did the Tea Party candidates lose? And I said, because we are the Tea Party. You know, we, the issues they were talking about were our issues, the issues we were running on, and so they didn't have any, there was no steam to the Tea Party candidate because our candidates were talking about deficits and debt and size of government and regulations and the same things. So, uh, you know, the, the, and also if you study the resumes of who was elected to the House and the Senate, yes, you're going to have some that are going to be hard to deal with. But a lot of them, particularly in the Senate, are experienced hands. Former congressman, former head of OMB, former whip in the, in the House. Uh, a, a lot of them have a really uh, good pedigree. Uh, for instance, Marco Rubio, the new senator from, from Florida. People say, well, he's going to be a Tea Party guy. Well, number one, he didn't join the Tea Party caucus. Number two, he was speaker of the Florida House of Representatives. Now, you can't have been speaker of a legislative body in any state and come to Washington and think you're going to blow the place up. You've got to figure out how to work in the place. I'm back to this mic and it's working. Wonderful. You all have covered a lot of um, hot button issues already. I'd like to ask you about another um, issue that sits uncomfortably with the American people at least and that's the issue of lobbyists. You've seen this from both sides. You've both worked in this realm and you've had them importuning you as members of the House and Senate. Just want to get your general view of the role and nature of lobbyists um, at a time when their unpopularity, both outside the Beltway and in the West Wing of the White House, it seems, has reached real heights. Well, again, I think there are, first of all, I think that representative government is about finding people who are going to make their case to Congress. And, uh, you know, there are, there are, all kinds of lobbyists today. There are lobbyists that advocate for children nutrition programs, to, for education, uh, for, for the entire banking industry. You healthcare. can go on and on. Health care. And so, um, you know, I, I actually think that they have a, a role to play. Uh, and I think that it's, what's important is ensuring that we're not, that as they play the role that, that I think our founding fathers envisioned, um, 
that, that it's not too prominent or too, uh, uh, too consequential a role at the expense of everybody else. If they're the only ones that can make their case to Congress, if they're the only ones that have access to a member of Congress, uh, then we don't have the balance in democracy that you have to have in order for this to be done right. So there has to be an understanding that uh, too much of anything is not good. And, and I think that's really what we have to be sure of, is making sure that, uh, that if, you're, if you're a lobbyist and you're uh, accessing your member, that we have a system that allows others to access that member too and get his or her case before that member just as the lobbyist did. Uh, Tom doesn't do lobbying, I do. And I don't apologize for it at all. Uh, if you, you know, you care about the Constitution, read the Constitution, First Amendment. It's not just about freedom of press and assembly and religion. It also says, and the right to seek regress with your government. So how do you do that? One of the clients we uh, have had, and my partner is former Senator John Bro from Louisiana, a Democrat, but we worked together in the House and the Senate. We were friends, our families were friends. And so when we left the Congress, we formed a partnership. We worked together. But one of our groups that we represent are the, the uh, Southern Fisheries Association. Uh, and it includes shrimpers. Now these are the men and women that go out on a shrimp boat. Most of them don't have much education. And they're out there trying to you know, harvest the seas. They have a huge problem with uh, imported shrimp and what happens to the, the tariffs or the fines that are administered by this government. That money goes into a fund. And under the B Byrd Amendment, Bob Byrd, it's redistributed. Okay, but without getting all the, down in the weeds, they have a real problem. They're being discriminated against. The money's going to the processors, not to the actual shrimpers. They need help. This even has an international component because it involves Ecuador, Vietnam, China, and these are uneducated fishermen in the Gulf of Mexico. That's where a lobbyist can help a group like that. Help them understand what the law allows. Take a look at why they're not getting some of the, the payments for the, the, the loss of their businesses. Uh, and then you communicate what you find to the United States Trade Representative or the Commerce Department or to the appropriate congressmen or senators that can fix the problem. I remember when I was in the Senate, I always made it a point to meet with groups from home, and I know Tom did. And who were they? Quite often, they included lobbyists or they included groups who were, in effect, lobbying. The Nurses Association, uh, you know, the representatives from the Chevron oil refinery in my hometown. I was not an expert in energy field, and I actually got information which helped me make decisions. And I wasn't just because they're the ones that gave me information didn't mean that's the way I was going to vote but I had a better understanding of what a refinery does in the provision of, of uh, energy and oil into this country. Also the boilermakers. My dad was a pipe fitter union member in a shipyard. Uh, a lot of people are shocked, uh, you know, that hey, this guy's a Republican and his dad was a pipe fitter union member. How'd that happen? Uh, so that's a long story. But, uh, <laughs> but I made it a point to meet with the, the representatives of, of the, uh, the boiler makers and the pipe fitters, their, their lobbyists, their members, when they'd come to Washington, and they would explain to me what was happening in the shipyard, why OSHA had a role in the shipyard, how there was a problem with safety, with asbestos, and falling off of the bow of a ship because there wasn't an adequate fence to keep these workers from backing off and falling off the bow of a ship. So there, but Tom is absolutely right. It's like everything else. Discretion, limits, uh, reporting, disclosure, and you need to use, you know, you need to be careful to not, to, you know, not get into a compromising position, either for the member of Congress or for the lobbyist. The world has turned its eyes to Egypt and as well as Tunisia, Yemen, and who, who knows where else. I'm not going to ask you detailed foreign policy questions about Egypt, but I would like to know if you were in your old seat as majority leader, what, if anything, could and should the U.S. Senate do um, to, uh, I'll leave it at that, what kind of move can, a, can, can the Senate make um, at a time like this, if anything, or a majority leader? Well, I think you're beginning to see members of Congress uh, step out. Uh, John McCain and John Kerry, for example, in the last 24 hours have, have indicated that they think that uh, there ought to be 
uh, that, that, that President Mubarak needs to, uh, needs to, uh, to depart and uh, that there ought to be free and fair elections in September as originally scheduled. Uh, I'm hopeful that that kind of, of uh, message could continue. I think we've got to support democratic movements, whether it's in Tunisia or Egypt or any place else. And you know, this is uh, this is an opportunity for us to, uh, to to really express pretty fundamental values. And uh, that's all I think the people in the streets of Egypt are looking for: is they want an opportunity to voice their concerns. Now, it's a little bit more problematic because Mubarak has been such a huge supporter of U.S. foreign policy. So it complicates matters. He has been an incredibly important partner in the, uh, in, the, in the Middle East as we've attempted to broker peace agreements. So we've got the historic peace agreement between Egypt and, and Israel, and it took a lot of courage to do that. But the time has come, and we've got to move on, and I think they are, there, are, there are possibilities that, 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 that the future government wouldn't be as supportive. Uh, but nonetheless, I think that's what democracy is all about. It can't be just a democracy that supports U.S. position. It's got to be a democracy that reflects the people of that particular country. So being supportive is, I think, something that we're beginning to see, and I think we'll probably see a lot more of it in the, in the days and weeks ahead. There's not a lot that the, the Senate could do directly, and you need to be cautious and careful how you inject yourselves into a situation in another country like this. In fact, I do think that's one of the problems with an American foreign policy. We get our, our nose stuck into things too far, too much already. However, Tom's right. I mean, we've got to be advocates of, uh, of the people, uh, you know, and their feelings and, and the democracy. Tonight, when I was coming here, and I saw your arch over here, and I saw Napoleon on the arch, and it, uh, it made me think about uh, the times we we're in and a quote from Napoleon, which uh, he said, uh, you're either kings or pawns of the people. He was wrong, just like he was wrong at Wellington. Uh, because, you, you know, you're not, pawn, you're not, you shouldn't, you know, you gotta be careful about being kings of people, being a dictator, or being, you know, uh, you know, the kinds of things that we see in other in places around the world. But that just because you have a democracy and, and you are re elected by the people and represent the people doesn't mean you're pawns of the people. And I, I thought that that was, a, that I always wondered about why he put it quite that way. Uh, maybe if you're the king, that's the way you view it, but that's not the way America uh, views it. Now, one other point too, uh, with regard to the Senate in this area, referring to that, to that hallowed document again, the Constitution, the Senate has some unique roles under the Constitution. We are the only ones, or the Senate are the only ones, <coughs> that do the confirmation. And that particularly is relevant when you're confirming, for instance, in foreign policy, the Secretary of State. And of course, it's very important when it, it comes to the federal judiciary. Uh, but also, the Senate's the one that has the lead and can ratifies the treaties. So if you look at the Constitution and the Senate, the Senate has a unique role in foreign policy. I didn't appreciate that fully until I got to the Senate. Uh, I, was, I had a pretty narrow view of the world when I was in the House. I would have probably been described as a protectionist, and frankly, I didn't really care a whole lot what went on in Tunisia. Uh, but when you get to the Senate, all of a sudden, you know, you're having to deal with nominees, and you're dealing with ambassadors, uh, both ours and theirs, and when they come to town, they want to meet with the President, the Vice President, the Sec Speaker of the House, and the leaders in the Senate. And I used to object, I don't want to meet with that king or this queen or that prime minister or that president. And they'd say, well, Tom's doing it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but also then you begin to take, you have to take a broader view. You're not just representing a shipbuilding community in a small part of the state of Mississippi or the state of South Dakota. You really are representing the whole country and you really are having to deal with the world. And I wound up being very much a free trade advocate. One of the things that Tom and I to do together now is to promote uh, trade and free trade for America. I voted for every trade agreement when I was in the Senate, whether it was uh, with, with China or, or NAFTA or CAFTA or uh, bilateral agreements because I concluded they were in our interest, not just in the interest of our allies like South Korea or Colombia, but it's really about making sure the mar their markets are open to our products. So uh, it's just like what you go through here at NYU. Being in politics and being in Congress 
is an education every day. Continue our education with a couple more questions from me, then we'll open up to all of you. Um, I want to ask about a, yet another hot button policy issue. Affordable Care Act, could it and should it be repealed? <laughs> Well, let me go first. Uh, <laughs> set the stage here. He uh, wrote the book. I would say emphatically no. I, I think that it's important for us to. We have huge, huge problems in healthcare in America. We have 51 million people who, at some time during the year, have no health insurance. Uh, we spend $8,000 now per capita in taxes, premiums, and out of pocket expenses for health. Uh, that's 40 to 50 percent more than the second most expensive country, Switzerland. And yet we have huge problems. The Inspector General of Health and Human Services say that one out of every seven people who enter the hospital now uh, are, are subject to medical mistakes. And 15,000 a month die because of medical mistakes. So we've got serious quality issues that have to be addressed. You know, what this legislation does is create a framework. It recognizes that we're we're, we're always going to have a public-private partnership, uh, about 50% public, 50% private in the country, uh, that, that we're going to have to come up with an architecture that allows us to give access to the 51 million that don't have insurance today, that, that begins to control costs and improve quality. And, and I, I really believe that our goal should be to produce a, a high-value, high-performance healthcare marketplace with greater access, better quality, and lower cost. That's what this legislation does. Now, you can differ on some of the provisions. Just today, the Senate voted 8117 to uh, repeal the so-called 1099 provision, which is this re provision that required any transaction of value greater than $600 had to be reported to the IRS. That's a $17 billion uh, uh, fund uh, source that's lost, but, but they voted 81 to 17, and I think I think uh, uh, you know, you're, you're going to continue to see uh, problems like that addressed over time. And I'm hopeful that over time, Republicans and Democrats can, uh, can, can find ways in which to, uh, to, to feel better about the legislation that's passed. You've got a major court case that will ultimately work its way to the Supreme Court in 2012. Uh, I think it'll probably be a five to four decision. And I wouldn't be surprised if Justice Kennedy is the swing vote. Uh, that, that will determine the outcome for the so-called individual mandate, the requirement that we all take some personal responsibility for our health. I think there ought to be two very important pillars to taking that responsibility. One, we ought to, we ought to um, recognize that it's our responsibility to pay for our insurance to the degree we have the capacity to pay for it. And that's really what the law now says. And secondly, we ought to take care of ourselves physically. We ought to, obesity is a pandemic in the United States. We've got to start making people understand the importance of good health and good nutrition. And that's the other aspect of personal responsibility that's so critical. Well, this begins to do that. And uh, so I'm very hopeful that we've, we've put a framework in place that will allow us ultimately over a 10 year period, that's how long this legislation is designed to be implemented, 10, 10 years, step by step, I hope that we give it the chance that I think it deserves. Tom and I are great friends, but we do have some philosophical <laughs> disagreements. Uh, but I believe in uh, disagreeing without being disagreeable. Uh, I would have voted against it uh, last year, as you might uh, have guessed. I do think it has a real constitutional problems with the mandate. Uh, but I'm also a pragmatist. It's not going to be overturned unless the courts do it. And then we are going to have a, a mess on our hands. We're going to have to start over again. Uh, it's not going to be, uh, you know, uh, repealed by the uh, Senate. And even that should happen, and it, I, don't, I know it won't, the president would still have the ability to veto it. It's like any bill, though, particularly a bill this complex and this big, it's got problems in it. And there are some things that they could do additionally that they didn't do. Yeah. So I thought, you know, the president, it probably made some of his base supporters mad, but he basically said, yeah, there's some things probably we can change. The, tw uh, the uh, 2009 section, for instance. Uh, I never have, I just can't understand why you shouldn't be able to buy insurance across state lines. 
uh, uh, and why should, you know, if you want to buy it somewhere else where they don't require or mandate as certain services, I don't know, to me that's sort of a freedom question. You ought to be able to do that. But uh, rather than spending uh, you know, all of their, or their time, or our time, uh, trying to reinvent this wheel, they ought to start trying to fix the problems that are in it and add new things that would make it better. Healthcare is a is an important issue in America. Affordability, accessibility, and my state is one that needs it desperately. A poor state, uh, we have sections in my state where if you 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 have a complicated pregnancy, it's 150 miles to the nearest even midwife. Uh, it's a problem. And obesity, we're number one in the nation. Uh, and it is a matter of education. It's a a matter of health care and, and how do we, we deal with not only the children but the adults. That's what we eat. Uh, you know, it's, it's a big problem. Now to the credit of the Chamber of Commerce in my state and the medical school, uh, they actually have been, they're really working on it. It's a, it is a public-private effort. To, and, and the First Lady has been to Mississippi to, to help us deal with our obesity problem. And our own state First Lady has it engaged. Uh, so we're, it, it's a fledgling effort, but we're trying to do something about it, and you certainly can't ignore the problem. Couldn't really get you all to disagree about that even. Uh -huh. um, well, thank you for this first part. We're going to turn to the audience now. What a wonderful expression of civility and, uh, and telling the truth uh, thus far. I appreciate your uh, candor as well. If you'd like to ask a question, please come to either side, and again, I'll alternate sides. Um, looks like we've got more folks on that side, so you're up. My goodness, a lot of questions. Are these all law students? No, no. This all is a university in New York, for that matter. Okay. Uh, I was in hopes they weren't all lawyers. No, no, you're right. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Diane Neary, and I just want to thank you both so much for coming and, and for this whole conversation. I've really enjoyed it. Um, I have a question for Mr. Daschle. Uh, you mentioned that you were largely motivated to go into politics by the Vietnam War. And um, I was pretty fascinated to learn that you were very outspoken about um, Vietnam veterans' exposure to Agent Orange and released some of the memos throughout the 80s that said that Agent Orange exposure um, would lead to birth defects in the offspring of veterans. Um, there are now veteran communities that feel this way, and the Internet has brought a lot of these contingents together, um, especially considering with the healthcare debate that um, some of the children and grandchildren of veterans with severe health conditions are among those 51 million without um, health care, health insurance. Um, so I just want to know, why do you think a comprehensive study was never done with regard to the descendants of veterans in terms of Agent Orange exposure? And do you feel the children of veterans who are covered for Agent Orange related disabilities um, should also be covered, even though they are children and not veterans themselves? Well, it's uh, the, the way I got into healthcare uh, public policy was was this. I was the first Vietnam era veteran to serve on the House Veterans Affairs Committee, and and uh, I guess probably because I was uh, uh, a Vietnam era veteran, these issues were of, of interest to me. And we knew so little, and it took so long to be able to to get to where we we could. And and unfortunately, because we had so little information. Uh, it took a long time. Even the veterans community was, was, was very dubious about this. They were concerned that, that uh, if the pie wasn't going to expand to accommodate all these new demands on the resources that they had to address these problems, that, that some veterans were going to have to give up something in order to help the others, and they were, they were concerned about that. But ultimately, there should have been more of a, of a comprehensive study. Uh, number one. Number two, I wish we would have acted more quickly with regard to compensation and medical care because unfortunately we lost a lot of Vietnam veterans that never had access to treatment in part because we just uh, dallied too long. Uh, and, and that the same could be said for PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome. Um, and in both cases, uh, ultimately we've evolved. I, I also believe that there is what they call tetragenacity, which is generational transfer of these diseases in some cases. I think it, now there's enough medical science to, to demonstrate that. Uh, and so I think we've got to be sensitive to that characteristic in this disease as well and try to help the, 
the, the next generation, those who are adversely affected. As someone who's spent quite a bit of time dealing with fetal alcohol syndrome, uh, I'm all the more sensitive to the issues that come during pregnancy for those who have been exposed to either alcohol or to toxic drugs like Agent Orange. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you guys so much again for being here. Uh, you talked about how hard it is to move legislation in the Senate, and I was just wondering your opinion on Harry Reid and his ability to ask Congress to move so much. Well, I, I actually think, Harry, I mean, history will show that, that the last Congress is contentious and polarized and problematic as it was in so many ways. It wasn't a, a fun place to work. Republicans and Democratic members alike complained about how contentious and and, 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 and uh, 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 confrontational it was. But at the end of the day, uh, they, they were able to get a, a lot of pieces of legislation passed. Uh, probably not nearly as bipartisan as I wish it would have been. I mean, whether it's health care or stimulus or uh, the START Treaty or any one of a number of things, there just wasn't the kind of bipartisanship that I think really makes for lasting legislation. But they were able to accomplish a lot, in part because they had the numbers. And those numbers aren't there this time. So they're going to be in a situation much like Trent and I had all during the 10 years that, that, uh, that I was leader. Um, you, have to, you have to reach out. Uh, and Republicans and Democrats have to get together to, to reach that 60-vote threshold necessary to, to pass anything. Um, you know, several thoughts on that. First of all, I, I'm, I'd never be critical of Harry Reid. I've been in that job, and I think he's got the toughest job in Washington. Tom will tell you that. The Speaker of the House has got the Rules Committee and, and the majority, and when uh, he or she decides there's going to be a vote and it's going to pass, it happens. Uh, when the President of the United States makes a decision, the whole government moves. When the Speaker, uh, when the, the leader, the majority leader in the Senate makes a decision, Nothing may happen. <laughs> you got to you got to have committee action. Lots of, most of the time, you have to, and it's not even a constitutional position. You have to you know, lead by the power of persuasion or respect for the position. It's very tough, and so I don't want to be critical of him. I do think that he and and Senator McConnell's personalities don't uh, jive quite as well as mine and uh, Tom's did. We we just uh, we've got a lot of common background, and I, just our personalities are different. And I think they have a hard time really communicating with each other. Uh, to uh, Harry's credit, when you, you look at the legislation that passed last year, they didn't pass much, and they didn't pass some of the things I thought they should have passed, like a budget. And I would have probably, <laughs> I would have probably voted against most of those big pieces he did. You've got to acknowledge that they were big pieces. Uh, and they did three or four you know, huge pieces. Now, they, on the new start, it was not, uh, well, one, that brings up another point. One of the ways to get the leaders to work together more, I think the president needs to lead a little bit more. He needs to engage a little more directly with, with the leaders. I think he was a little bit too inclined to say, here's what I want to see happen. Good luck, Congress, figure it out. Uh, and there's, a, there's a, a strain of thought that says that's the way it should be. I think the president needs to lead a little bit more. But I'd like to think, okay, look, it was the first two years, new administration, historic goals, you know, big problems. Okay, we've done that. Now, and one of the things I said, I wrote an article, a column, which I actually said to Harry uh, through the column, in effect, quit looking for legislation that you can call up you know there's going to be fight over. Try to pass some things that are less controversial, Try to, what tends to facilitate working together. Get one, then get two, and then maybe you can lead to another one. This year, I think there's potential for that. I think they're going to pass this Federal Aviation Administration bill. You might say, well, what the heck is that? Why is that important? Well, you want to fly in a safe airline? <laughs> Would we like to have a GPS in an airplane like we've got in a dad blame car? Let's modernize it. And they've, they've, that bill has been pending since 2007. I worked on the bill when I was still in the Senate, and they haven't passed it. They've had 16 extensions. And we're talking about modernizing aviation. They can do that. I think they're going to do some stuff on budget controls. I think they're going to do something in education. That's not about, I mean, a partisan issue. That's a, I mean, that's something you can get agreement on. When, when Ted Kennedy and John Boehner can agree on an education bill, anybody ought to be able to agree. <laughs> uh, and energy, Tom and I have talked about that. I think that 
you know, some of the things that they were arguing over the last couple of years, that's by the board now, let's see what we can agree on. And then the, the, the final thing is the, what I call the three T's, taxes, trade, and transportation. Now, I'm one of those Republicans that does think that while you ought to control spending, we've got way too much deficit, way too much debt. If we're going to have growth in the economy, we've got to do something. You know, it's great to control spending and control regulations and all that, but what are we going to do to actually help create some jobs, incentivize some jobs? Well, controlling government helps that. But I think when it comes to lanes, planes, trains, ports, and harbors, where you build something, you create a job, and when you get through, you got something. So I, and that is a nonpartisan or a bipartisan issue. So I hope that they will, that Harry will look to those areas where there is the potential uh, for bipartisanship. And when he does, then I think McConnell and the Republicans should respond with cooperation and support. Thanks. We'll switch back to this side. If you all would say just your name and where you are at NYU, if you're here, you can help identify uh, yourselves. Good evening, gentlemen. Again, welcome to NYU. My name is Alexander Grijalva. I'm, I'm an alum and also a graduate student at SEPS. Uh, some Americans argue that the 14th Amendment never intended for the U.S.-born children of illegal immigrants to become citizens. Can a similar argument be extended to the Second Amendment, that private citizens were never intended to own or be able to purchase military-grade or military-style weapons? Well, I'll be brief. Uh, I, I think uh, that uh, the 14th Amendment uh, did intend for them to be citizens when they were born here, and I think that the Second Amendment did intend for the private citizens to have the right to buy, bear arms. I, I think uh, that the historic interpretations were right. Should we, should we continue to think about that or you know, uh, make sure we're doing it the right way? Yeah, but uh, I think in both cases we're, we've got it pretty close to right. I, I agree with that. I, I, I would say, though, that I do think it's imperative that we begin to deal with gun violence in this country in a lot more profound and effective ways. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, I, 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 we're going to reach a point in this country where it's, it's really uh, a threat to society in, in, in profound ways that affect us all. I mean, all we have to do is remember Arizona. Uh, I do think that the Second Amendment is the Second Amendment, and it's interpreted as it should be. And, but I think at the same time, it's up to Congress to find ways to make the streets safer and to make society more civil than it is right now. Uh, John Bradamus. As... Uh, <clears throat> As a sponsor of the Center for the Study of Congress that is sponsoring this discussion, I simply want to say how immensely proud I am of the presentations made by my two former colleagues in Congress. I think we've been exposed to brilliant analysis of some of the issues facing our country. And I want to thank m both my former colleagues with uh, great warmth. And uh, I yield back the balance of my time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, John. Thank you. My name is Chuck Lesnick. I'm an alum of the law school, and I'm also a local legislator. I'm the city council president of Yonkers, just north of here. A lot of people in New York think that the health care bill didn't go far enough, especially not having a public option. I want to ask Senator Daschle, had you been Secretary of Health and Human Services, what would you have done differently in terms of both substance and process in getting a bill passed? Well, that's a, that's a, I, I, first of all, I, don't, I, I think it's dangerous to second guess anybody. You have to have been there and walk a mile in the shoes, uh, if I can use that term. Uh, you know, and I, the fact is that our country tried for close to 100 years to pass comprehensive health re reform, and, and we did. Uh, was it everything I would have liked? No. I would have supported a public option. Uh, very enthusiastically. I, I, I think if, if the bill fails, it fails mostly in the cost containment area. I think we've got to do a lot more, uh, and I think we can. I think there are a lot of 
demonstration projects, pilot projects, payment reform, quality improvements, greater transparency, the use of HIT. I mean, there are a lot of things in this that have the potential for cost containment, but I think it would have been helpful we would have, if we would have delineated it a little bit more. The other thing is that I, I wish we would have made it, we could have found a way to make it more bipartisan. Uh, it wasn't, it became very polarized and it remains polarized today. And that's unfortunate because it creates the uncertainty that we're all experiencing now. So I think it's really important when you pass major pieces of legislation like that, that you try to be as inclusive as possible. But it is what it is, and it happened in large measure because uh, I think there was a, a recognition that the status quo was just untenable. Uh, but uh, I go back to my first point. I, I, I don't want to second guess who did what because I think uh, the fact is at the end of the day, they got it done, even though it was uh, probably not what any one person would have preferred. There are, that's the art of compromise. The art of legislating is to recognize that you can't make the perfect the enemy of the good. That's an overused phrase, but that certainly was the case in health reform. Mike Summers, New York University um, administrator and alum. Um, I just have a general question. If I've read and understand correctly, I know that there are proposals being discussed to allow for state bankruptcies. And I'm wondering if you wonder how that might play out or how the federal and state leaders will, will work together to make this all, I guess, work. First of all, uh, while it is being discussed some in the media and by members of Congress, and, and actually the, the two people that have actually spoken out on it are both Republicans a House member, and John Cornyn from Texas, which really surprised me because he, uh, he, I wouldn't think he would be inclined to be for it, and I don't think he was saying that, but he has talked about it. Now, he also was a, a state Supreme Court justice, so he, he may have a legal point of view uh, that I haven't uh, explored with him yet or that I understand. Uh, Newt Gingrich, by the way, has talked about how we might need to do something like this. I don't think it's going to happen at least in the next couple of years. Um, I just don't see the House Republicans uh, being inclined to vote for that. Uh, but, you know, we've got at least three states and probably a lot more to follow that have tremendous uh, problems with their, their debt and the, the economy in their states. And uh, they've been living off of, uh, frankly, uh, you know, stimulus funds or the Congress actually gave money directly to states for Medicaid and, and just lumps of money. Uh, and that's beginning to play out. And the, the states are really struggling with it all across the country. Some of them have even you know, come to the conclusion, gee whiz, we're going to have to uh, cut spending and, and raise taxes. Uh, some of them are trying to do one or the other. But once it, you know, what, what is going to happen when a state like California, if they basically just say we can't, we can't cut any more services, we, you can't raise more taxes. We're going belly up here. Save us, con uh, Congress. And if Congress is allowed to say, sorry. So what happens? Um, I, I just, uh, I don't, I'd, I'd really want to really get into studying the legalities and the constitutional problems with uh, state bankruptcy. But um, it at least is being academically uh, looked into uh, now and it you know somewhere down the line we may have to some people say well look if municipalities can do it why not states well there are some constitutional reasons why not uh, and also of course the Congress is a lot of them are going to be thinking if we if we give them this way out they'll take it there are others who are going to say on, on my side of the aisle uh, this would be one way to get the so-called pension problems under control because you know they got some huge unfunded mandates out there. I don't know what the number is in California alone, but it's billions. Somehow or other, they've got to deal with that. Yeah, I, 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 I agree completely. I guess I would say two things. One, I think it's a very, very dangerous precedent. And secondly, I'd be aware, I'd be beware of unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. We really don't know what kind of a, we used to have a colleague, a, a colleague of ours, uh, Senator Bingaman, uh, would always say in our caucus meetings, this could open a box of Pandoras. <laughs> and uh, I think that uh, this is certainly going to open up a box of Pandoras. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Jasper from China. I'm here as a um, Stern undergraduate. First of all, 
Happy New Chinese New Year because now it's a Chinese New Year's Eve. And here are my this questions. This is the year of the what? Rabbit. rabbit. Yes, good. Year of rabbit. I like rabbit. <laughs> here are my questions to both leaders. Um, what do you think about this assertion? The essence of the bi-party or two-party system in the U.S. is its um, competitiveness and reconciliation. Reconciliation, whatever it is. <laughs> Not a number of parties. If this um, assertion is unreasonable, is it because only multi multi party system can lead to the dynamics of competitiveness and and uh, reconciliation? Thank you. Could I'm not sure I understood uh, the way the question was phrased. Would, would, are oh, you my, saying that? Sorry, are you the, asking um, if if the two party system is in effect? Like uh, the essential advantage of um, two-party system in the U.S. is its interaction between competitiveness and reconciliation. I wonder what this is like. Well, recently. you're asking, I guess, for us to, how would that compare to, for instance, a European system or other systems where they have multiple parties? Or like right. uh, multiple right. parties or like yeah. in China, like yeah. one party system. Do you want to try that? Well, I... I <laughs> <laughs> Good luck, Tom. <laughs> They say that a good political answer is one that's long enough for you to forget the question. So <laughs> maybe we can just talk on and you forget the question. But uh, I, I actually think that, that uh, the competitiveness that you see within the two-party system here is, is, uh, is actually a, a good thing. I, I, yeah. I think it's, it's actually helped us in many respects. And I would go back to something Trent mentioned earlier. It really does require leadership. You know, leadership, whether it's a two-party or a multi-party system, is the key ingredient to making a republic work. And that really is the key. You know, we, we have a democratic republic in this country, and it all depends on the caliber of leadership. Now, we've had occasions, and we've been very lucky as a country, uh, at those times when we really needed it the most, and Abraham Lincoln, you know, uh, I would say the Roosevelts and, and different people throughout history have risen to the occasion when we've faced crises uh, and, and have shown how reconciliation and competition between the two parties are not irreconcilable. And I'm hopeful that, that as we go through this very, very important transformation of our, new, of our society, that that leadership will rise. I believe that three fundamental ingredients are important for us to be successful. One is we have to continue to be resilient as the American uh, character has been in the past. We have to continue to be innovative. We have to uh, incent innovation as much as possible, but we also have to show leadership. And uh, that's really critical. You know, I've, I've been uh, to other countries when I was in the leadership positions and I've, I've asked a lot of questions of particularly Europeans uh, whether it's Italians or the British, uh, you know, where they've got multiple parties, uh, does this make more sense? Should we try to, I mean, there's some people in America think we ought to have a more parliamentary system. I don't. I still think we have, with all its faults, uh, the greatest uh, system of government the minds of men have ever conceived. Uh, it's, it's a great system. And I'm an advocate of a two-party system. Some people say, well, maybe we should have a third party, the Tea Party or a Socialist Party. No. Uh, <laughs> I think we should have two parties. Uh, I, it is competitive. Uh, it's messy enough. And if I think we had, if we had four or five parties, it'd be even messier. Uh, I, I, while I get agitated and I worry about our system, I worry about my country, I still think when we back away from it, I mean, just like right now, we face a lot of challenges internationally and in this country. Uh, we're worried about the economy. Are we pulling out of it? But yet, you know, it's like the resilience of the American people the system we have, I'm convinced we're going to pull out of this, uh, and there are signs uh, all over the place that it's beginning to happen. Uh, once we ever make up a mind it is over, it'll be over. Uh, so I hope we've answered your question, but I, 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 the bottom line is I think what we have is competitive enough. Uh, I do think in a way, because we have only two, it makes it it's more competitive. But uh, Tom is right. Anytime you have vigorous debate, that's good. I think it's testament to the level of debate we've had here tonight that there's 20 of you still waiting to ask a question. I will break 19 of your hearts and say I'm told this is the last question. Akene. Hi, thank you for being here. My name is Akene Freechild. I'm a graduate student at NYU Wagner School of Public Service. And you had mentioned the amount of time you have to spend fundraising now to win a Senate seat or a seat in Congress. 
and we had a pretty powerful change in campaign finance law this last year, so now that corporations can donate it unlimited amounts of secret money to elections. Um, what do you think should be done uh, to address the change, if anything, um, both ideally and politically? Well, I, I, I think that... <laughs> Now, I'm not trying just to, trying to dump it on him. I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to be courteous, you know. <laughs> this probably is an area where Trent and I disagree, but, uh, but I, 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 I actually support a constitutional amendment to limit spending uh, on campaigns because it, I think it's just gotten out of hand. My last race uh, was in South Dakota where about 350,000 people voted. Uh, the entire race was $50 million, $25 million on his side. And uh, that's what it was in Nevada in this last time uh, when Harry Reid ran. So, uh, you know, the amount of time you spend, and in the last year of your six-year cycle, uh, it's not uncommon to spend 50 to 70 percent of your time fundraising, going to events all over the country and dialing for dollars on the phone every day. You know, and I just think the country suffers when a when a, a legislator has to spend that kind of money, that kind of time raising that kind of money. And, but the only way you're going to do it, uh, you know, because of the First Amendment, the only way you're going to do it today is with a constitutional amendment. Now, there is a second way that I'd also support, but we've tried it and it hasn't worked all that well, and that's public financing. Um, you know, to incent people to, uh, uh, to limit voluntarily the amount of money they take. I'd, I'd support that even though I think it's a distant second, just because it doesn't, uh, it, 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 it hasn't worked as much as I wish it it could have. Now, you can argue we didn't fund it adequately and we didn't provide it uh, more universally across the system. So there are things that you could do to maybe improve it. But um, short of that, I don't know how we get ourselves out of this box. Well, since this is the last question, I'll try to uh, end it on a light note and, and, that, and just say, well, I'd rather just be anointed frankly, <laughs> than have to go through all of this. It, it is difficult. It is challenging. But I take the, almost the, the, the other extreme position. I'm for uh, complete, open, uh, you know, uh, campaign. I like the Virginia plan. No limits. Anybody can give whatever they want, whatever amount, as long as it is totally disclosed and instantly disclosed so the people can judge. I still just have fundamental faith uh, in, in people's judgment. Uh, even though I worry about the amount of money that's involved, a lot of people, some of the people that complain the most about the money involved are people that are in the broadcasting industry. Hey, they're the ones that make it cost so much. You gotta get on TV. There's a saying in politics, if you're, if you're running for office and you're not on TV, you don't exist. And that's what really just eats up you know, tons of money. Uh, I, I do struggle with, uh, with um, how we deal with it, but when you start public financing of campaigns, I just, I, I, that to me is a step toward government, again, being in a position where they can control campaigns, and I don't want that to happen. Um, maybe we, we'll just have to, it's one of those things that I think we ought to have seminars, we ought to sit down and we ought to talk about, it. okay, we got a problem here. Uh, one side is just have the government take it over, you know. Uh, limit, put limits and controls and all of that. The other side is, hey, free speech, free enterprise, let them go at it. Is there, is there a middle ground? Is there some way, some, some limits? Uh, you know, uh, I have supported some limits. I do think that, you, you know, like on negative campaigns, I, I think if you advertise, you need to, you need to, we need to know who's doing it. I don't like that. And I also have supported, uh, you know, limits on uh, negative campaigns right at the end of a campaign where, you know, remember we've had a situation where people could run just a just des destructive ad and not even acknowledge who it was. Or even if they did, it was right at the end where it's devastating and you can't respond to it. So there are some elements of unfairness about it. Uh, fair campaign legislation, maybe we ought to think about that. Uh, but uh, this is something we could spend a whole night discussing, uh, trying to come up with good ideas, better ideas. Uh, it is a concern for Republicans and Democrats, uh, conservatives and liberals and moderates, uh, but uh, I don't think we've found the right solution yet. When John Bradamus told us a few months ago he wanted to have a high-profile Democrat and a high-profile Republican sit together on stage at NYU, 
um, for this year's uh, high profile event for his center, it seemed almost impossible in this age of high polarization. It's a testament to John and to Tom McIntyre, who's standing over here and made this evening go in many ways. That that this happened, and above all, it's testament to these generous, um, distinguished, and remarkably candid gentlemen that we've had the quality of conversation we have this evening, made me at least hope for the future of two parties getting together and talking things out. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good Thanks. job. Thanks. Thanks.